نحمده ونصلي على رسول الكريم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and jazakum khair for staying behind uh, i won't take up uh, too much of your time i know your time is valuable and i also believe that 20 minutes 25 minutes maximum half an hour is more than sufficient time to get the uh, juices flowing so we can focus on what we need to focus on uh, today or for <coughs> asr salah the topic that was given or the broader description of the topic was attachment to the quran and the salah now either that was uh, very well thought out by the organizers or that was a, a bit of good fortune having hutna then we will say that it was very well thought out because the two are linked together but before we get into the topic itself if we one of the things they were finding in the society and being in the position that we are in in, in terms of serving the community we get a lot of uh, matters that we have to deal with when it comes to say husband and wife kind of break up marriage break up and as the years have gone on that number is increasing and there's always problems and unfortunately it goes to talaq and you're now sort of finding out when you're having conversations you know a brother's been married three or four times or a sister's been married two or three times and it seems that divorce is on the rise within the muslim community similarly we find that many of sort of my generation people will speak about the younger generation people and say that you know we can't seem to get on i seem to always be at loggerheads with this person we're always shouting at each other i would like him to do this he wants to do this and then you know we quick to blame the country or quick to blame the schools or quick to blame some other aspect of society rather than look at take the responsibility ourselves but if you look at all these things there's one thing which is at the core of this and that is communication you'll find if you ask the couple what was the start of your break up what was the initial things and they'll say oh we used to fight it's okay go further back and if you push the couple further back during your discussions they will reach to the point where they will say communication broke then after that suspicion then after suspicion disrespect then after this you know it builds up and then eventually the marriage breaks but if you go further keep peeling the onion keep going back the core of it is the communication went similarly when you speak to parents and their children and you ask them or rather the parents what was the first thing or oh, he disrespected me yes i know but go back and if you take them back the core they will be is communication once i could no longer communicate with my son once i could no longer communicate with my daughter once my son or daughter stopped talking to me then that was the start and then suspicions and then you know pulling missions and then i was getting angry and then you know i ended up kicking him out of the house but we got to always take it back to where it starts from so you might be thinking what is the relevance of marriage break up what is the relevance of this generational gap and then my topic of association attachment to the quran and to salah now those of you who've listened to any of my lectures will see that the connection will be there it may be a little bit hidden but inshallah hopefully i will be able to bring it to the fore what is the quran and what is salah the quran and the salah are based on communication when you want to hear what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got to say to you you recite the quran When you want to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you pray salah that's why the two topics are linked together because they are our mode of communication so what happens we've already talked about the result of the communication breakdown that takes place between a husband and wife and what it results in divorce everybody's upset the kids are upset the families are upset nobody's happy similarly when we talk about the lack of communication between the elder generation and the younger generation what is the result children abandoning homes unfortunately ending up in scenarios where they don't have the experience or the support to make the right decisions and then they make the wrong decisions and once they make the wrong decisions they then feel bad to go back home because they've done things now which they think my mother father will never accept me because i've done this or i've done that but the core is communication So what is the result if our communication breaks down with Allah Now when we speak about a husband and wife we're speaking about 
individuals who are equals. The husband benefited the wife. And the wife benefited the husband. So it was a mutually beneficial relationship. Both gained. Similarly, when we talk about parents or the older generation and the younger generation, again, it's mutually beneficial. It might be that the older generation is investing at the beginning. But then eventually that pays back. Because then when we start getting a little bit old, start getting a little bit crooked, then we expect those young children that we raise to now look after us like the way we looked, looked after them. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship. But our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not of mutual benefit. It is solely for our benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not benefit from our salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not benefit from our zakah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not benefit from anything we do for him. The only individuals is us. So if we can understand the marriage breakup relationship, and some of us may have gone through that, or some of us may know a close family member or friend who's gone through that, and we know the difficulty that person faced. And similarly, when we try to explore the relationship breakdown between a parent and a child, and we may have experienced that, we may have family or friends who've experienced that, we know the devastating effect it has on that person. That guy doesn't care what he looks like. He's always upset. He's always in so, so always thinking, always <coughs> worrying. He hardly care, taking care of himself, whatever. And he's so preoccupied in this problem that he's stuck in. So how do you think the person will be when it is that he breaks his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When everything that that person has in his life is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When his health, his wealth, his family, everything, any, there's not one aspect of his life that is not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been involved. And he breaks that relationship. He detaches from the Quran. He detaches from Salah. He breaks his link. The link that he spent a great deal of time in forming. Sometimes when you, you know, when you're younger, you have a close friend that literally if you don't talk to him in a day, you feel like they're strangers. So the next time you see him, it's a bit awkward. You know, you've got to get kind of that, all oh, right, okay, so how are you? Yeah, you're all right. Uh, and you've got to kind of go through the ice period for a little bit. And then it's back to normal again, where it's just, you know, like your two brothers, like it's normal. So we've spent a great deal of time or have done over the 25 days in forming our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solely for our benefit. We're now entering the last three, four days of Ramadan. Now, we're, you know, we forget quite quickly, but I'll let us recap where we were last Ramadan. Maybe similar time on the 25th of Ramadan. And what did we think about then? What did we think about then? Did we also have these, you know, were we also praying all our salahs in jama'ah? Had we dealt with some of our qadha salahs? You know, were we on a kind of a spiritual high? What was our recitation like? Had we completed one Qur'an? We may have started before Ramadan with big, big aspirations that I'm going to do five khatams this Ramadan. Or I'm going to do eight or ten or whatever. Obviously after day ten we kind of recalculate based on current projection. It's not working out as well, but at least it's there. And we have, you know, we do, we are very successful. We know that because when we pick the Mus'haf on the first of Ramadan and we found our Mus'haf mark, it was where we left it last Ramadan. So we think, okay, you know, inshallah, I will move forward. What's to think that this Mus'haf mark that you leave, inshallah, on the 29th of Ramadan, a little bit of a prediction there for you, that you leave on the 29th of Ramadan, in your mushaf, that that is going to be the same place you will see it on the first of Ramadan, 1441. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the fortune to be alive. So what happens then if our relationship deteriorates with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What happens if our relationship breaks, God forbid, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, we've seen the outcome of relationships of a worldly sense. We've seen that you have close friends, you have close family members. Now imagine they stopped communicating with you. Imagine they started to ignore you. Imagine they started to disrespect you. Imagine they considered you not to even exist anymore. How would your relationship be with that person? It could be our wife. It could be our child. It could be our parent. It could be a very close friend. 
This is why our link with the Quran and Salah has to continue. Because all it means then is after we break this link, we break this bond, and only we will suffer as a consequence. So the question arises, because I wanted this second session, as in when I was here two, two three weeks ago, I wanted this sec- second session to be more, not just you listening uh, and me talking, but I wanted it to be more engaging, interactive. Uh, I have a teaching background, and they say that passive learning is the worst type of learning. So when you sit there with your mouths open, it's not because you're in awe of me. It's not because you think, wow, this guy speaks really well. It's because you're falling asleep. Okay? And that's why your jaw is dropping. It's not that I'm speaking in a jaw-dropping fashion. It's because you're falling asleep after about the 25th minute. You know, your eyes start getting glazed over. You start to struggle what it was I was actually talking about. What was this brother's topic? It starts to get a bit cloudy. So we need to interact. If we want this Ramadan to be different than the Ramadan previously and the Ramadan before that, then we need to look at, I do not know each person's dilemmas. I do not know each person's situation. I can speak in a general way, and I assume from what I'm saying, it will target most people. But that doesn't deal with your personal issue. It doesn't deal with your personal issue. It doesn't deal with anyone's own situation that they're in, that they need to somehow overcome that. So the question I will put to you, so let's do a little bit of uh, engaging with the uh, audience. So the question I will put to you, gives me a little few seconds to get some air and some oxygen, is how are you personally going to ensure that your link and association with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues? And I don't want, I will obviously carry on reading the Quran. I, I know that's the answer. I will obviously keep praying salah. I'm going to say to you, how? We know what the answer is, because I just explained it to you, I've already given you the answer. I'm asking you is how? You know your lifestyle, you know you're going to get back to your 9 to 5 or whatever else it is. Uh, did they work longer? I was in London. Okay, you're going to get back to your 9 to 18 or whatever it is. Um, whatever hours they do here in London. And then you're going to go back to your normal routine. So how are you going to bring this into your normal routine? So I'm going to leave that with you, inshallah. I'll give you a few minutes. And then please, don't be shy. I would like a few of you to put your hands up. And maybe those of us who are struggling for ideas, maybe some of us can give those ideas, inshallah. So I'll give you a few minutes. And you can talk to the person next to you. Look at that. So pick the person sat next to you wisely. Try to find somebody who's got good ideas. So I allow you, just confer with the person. We said, don't need to open a buzz. How are you going to ensure that you will maintain that relationship that you have made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Look how the masjid is full, mashallah, after Asr. Will that be the case in Shawal? Will that be the case in Dhul Qa'da? Will that be the case in Dhul Hijjah? Will that be the case after that? If not, why not? What can you do? What can the masjid do? Can you have little circles? You know, I'm going to open it up to you. I'll give you a couple of minutes, inshallah. Bismillah. Let's not pretend to be shy. And there'll be no iftari for a person who doesn't come up with anything. So some, mashallah, engaging with the process. Some setting up an objection to it. Some of us in denial. Answers. Don't. You got answers. Yeah, well, let's see. It's an engaging one, isn't it? I did say we would be more interactive. Another minute. Go on, youngsters. How are you going to ensure? That your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues after Ramadan. Okay, so we've had a few minutes. Jazakullah khair. Uh, we've had a few minutes, so if I could please ask you to put your hand in the air and put forward your suggestions. No need to be shy. G brother. Wa alaikum salam.
overcome that, you will not enjoy reading the Quran. That's part one. Second is, uh, we were speaking to a brother of is um, when it's about the Trump and Islam, Allah, etc. Allah, etc. Allah, etc. Allah. Amen. So we're just reading the, uh, the, the translation. Now this is another part that, because we're reading Arabic all the time, we don't know what's going on. Only when we read the translation, we understand what Allah is saying to us, and what the message is. And all it takes is that you open the Quran whenever you come in situations, and you, and you read the translation, you'll find that Allah is giving you advice to your specific situation as well. But if you don't, if you don't read the translation, we'll never know what the message is. So let me get your name, brother. Harun. Brother Harun has mentioned two very good points, alhamdulillah. That's why I asked you guys to do it, because I want to come up with them. Two very good points, which is the basis of communication. The basis of communication, when you do speak to couples, and when you do speak to families, they talk past each other, not talk to each other. So if ever the time you've been having an argument with your wife, are you really listening to what she's saying? No, you're not. You're just shouting at her. Is she actually listening to what you're saying? No, she's not. She's just shouting at you. You're talking past each other. So this is not communication. You're just basically shouting. She's shouting and no one knows what, what is anybody else is saying uh, until obviously the, the, it calms down. So when it comes to listening to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got to say to you, then first of all is being able to articulate and recite the Quran in the correct manner. That's important. Now, sometimes we get into a situation whereby we feel embarrassed. You know, we feel embarrassed if we're a 20-odd-year-old or a 30-odd-year-old or a 40-odd-year-old or even high, older than that. Now, how can I now go and sit and learn this? Unfortunately, this is an element of arrogance. Unfortunately. And we have to remove that arrogance in order to kind of humble ourselves and go seek that learning. So that's a very good point about the seeking of the learning. The second point is, is understanding the Qur'an. Now I'm fortunate, I have lived a time when I didn't understand a word of the Qur'an. And I now live in a time where, alhamdulillah, I can understand the Qur'an with its tafsir and ahkam. And I've lived everything else in between, the spectrum from there to there. There is no substitute, can never be. I even think, how is it that I used to pray without understanding the Qur'an? When I think now, I think, how did I pray? How could I stand for an hour and a half in Taraweeh and not understand a single word that I was reciting? How did I do it? What level of uh, strength I must have had, strength of faith and conviction in my Iman to stand for an hour and a half and not understand a single word apart from Allahu Akbar every now and then as to what Imam Sahib was saying. And this is unfortunately what we've accepted because of the way we've structured our education. So what we do is when we're children, we feel obliged as parents to send our children to maktab. So when our children go to maktab, then we feel obliged that they should be able to recite the Qur'an. As soon as one khatam is done, that khatam is unfortunately, it doesn't mean that, you know, alhamdulillah, the person has recited the Qur'an. It means khatam, that's it, no more. There's no more after this. Now if he's fortunate or the parents are fortunate, he may become hafid of Qur'an and they carry on with his studies. Otherwise, majority of our children after 10, 11, 12, leave. When they leave, they then get these issues about LGBTI, evolution, atheism, and they're dealing with co uh, matters which unfortunately we don't have the expertise. And they're in their young minds, in their formative years, are trying to deal with that, and they're trying to say, what does Islam say about this? Should I accept that Adam Islam evolved from some ape-like creature? Is that part of my iman? Does the Big Bang theory go against creation, or does it support creation? What is atheism? How does my religion, is atheism a fair, unbalanced, over, overarching, rational philosophy and religion is dogmatic? How do you, you know, we're trying to understand the questions. Our poor children are having to give them answers. So, the Quran is full of answers. And, and as the brother eloquently puts, the Quran will respond to you depending on your circumstances. Again, I will use my personal uh, experience. Alhamdulillah, I've been fortunate. My parents also sent me when I was a young child to maktab. So I've been reciting the Quran. I know you might be surprised that I'm in my 40s. You would say, subhanAllah. Brother, you don't look more than 33. Um, it's the uh, thing that I wax that I put in my beard. So I've been living for a, a long while now. And every time I've gone to recite the Quran, and there's something that I'm dealing with, either emotionally or some matter, I find some contentment, I find some uh, serenity, I find peace in the Qur'an. And I go on my way, 
Yeah, I know I've recited that surah 50 times, 500 times, 5,000 times. What are the different stages you are in your life? The Quran speaks to you. This is no book like any other textbook. This is a book which is the Kalamullah, the spoken word of Allah, the uncreated word of Allah. It is miraculous. And miraculous, if I was to sit here and shout abusive words to you, within a short space of time, your temperature will go, your face will go red, you'll get angry, and obviously you want to hit me. Now these are just worldly words I'm using. And look what kind of reaction I'm getting from you. Imagine the divine words of Allah, what that is actually doing to us. So two good points there, Brother Harun. Jazakum khair for sharing those with us. One is, let's get our tajweed sorted. So I want in response to that, how are we going to get our tajweed sorted? What are we going to do? It's all right by saying, let's get it sorted. It's a good point, but where do we go from there? And what are we going to do about engaging with the Quran itself in terms of its understanding? So if someone was talking about that, if someone could please put their hand up with that. If they weren't talking about it, then on the spot, see if you can give me some solutions for that. How could we engage with the recitation and engage with the Sunni brother at the back? I think you know, masjid, they need to do more people add You know, like you said, a lot of people are trying to come forward. Yep. A lot of people work as well, so there's not enough classes for adults as well. So we emphasize so much people on youth, which is very important. Sure. But at the same time, we need to open the doors for adults as well. Sure. So they won't come and have a time table so we can come and understand the Quran. Inshallah. Yeah. Well. Excellent, excellent. So that's a suggestion which I will make on your behalf, uh, inshallah, to the committee. But I will also say, we spent a long time as part of our institute, the Olive Foundation, which is based in Bradford. One of the queries we were getting is that the ulama are in the masjid and we are outside, you know, we're on our phones, we're on whatever. So we spent a great deal of time setting up numerous social media platforms. So we're available on YouTube, on Telegram, on Twitter, you name it, you search my name or search my institute, you will find we're on all those platforms. And we produce a lot of videos dealing with many of the queries that I've just said to you. But yes, sometimes the face-to-face -face element is also essential. So, Jazakum khair for that. So, classes, we can look at those kind of things as well. Okay, let's, another, another point before we then finish off for today, inshallah. Somebody else, a separate discussion, not to what Harun said. So, were you with Harun? Oh, I don't know if that's fair. <laughs> Sorry, I think we're going to have to scupper that one for you. Somebody else, something a little bit different uh, than what Harun and his, uh, and his friend were speaking about. Otherwise, it's going to be his friend again, and then it's just going to be all them. G. Just uh, some of the things. Uh, the connection with the masjid, uh, it's easy to pray five times a day, anywhere you are. Uh, but coming to the masjid is actually uh, building that connection, as you say. Uh, you know, making salah here. Fajr, for example. The hardest one to, to come to. Uh, if you make that initial step, uh, come once, twice, put it into a routine, you lose that connection with the masjid. That's, that's one of the things that yeah. you could do. What's your name again, brother? Uh, Fahad. Fahad. Fahad, mashallah, makes a, a good point there. Routine. We have a routine. When you wake up in the morning, you're doing most of your stuff on autopilot. I've sometimes ended up to a place that I was never intending to drive to because I was on autopilot. And I think, what am I doing here? So a lot of stuff you do is autopilot. How you get dressed, where you're going, your work, the, the time you start, the time you finish, it becomes autopilot. So you have to somehow, within your timetable, put coming to the masjid as part of it. So initially it may be salah like asr, or as the days become shorter, maghrib or isha, because they will fit around our schedule a little bit better. Once that becomes a little bit firm, then we can start to look at others. One of the things that I do find, brothers, that it works well, is when there's a small kind of group of people. So when one brother doesn't come to the masjid, then you're the four or five, so like a group of friends or a small group will say, brother, I didn't see you in the Isha today. You know, so it's, it becomes, it is an act of worship, but there's a social element to it. We use social pressures, if I can use that word, to bring about coming to the masjid regular. So, that's another very important point. So routine. How are you going to make your routine now has been solely in the direction and worship of Allah? You've been eating. Normally we eat at different times. We've all been eating. Well, maybe not for suhoor time, but we've all been eating at the same time for when we break fast. Whereas suhoor, obviously, 1 o'clock, 1.30, 2 o'clock, 2.30, 3 o'clock, maybe 3.30 today. Nah, let's stretch it to 4. You know, there's different times there. So let's put that one to one side. But when it comes to if that time we're all eating, you know, the, if you want to know where somebody is at 9.35, you know he's going to have a big plate in front of him and he's going to be eating. But when we go back to our normal lives and our 
food time changes, our sleeping time changes, our daily routine changes. So what we've got to do is somehow is bring a salah into our routine. Because remember, the single, I've mentioned this in, I think probably whilst I was here last time, that when the lion attacks the zebra, when the lion attacks or the hyena attack in, in packs or the wolves attack, they don't attack the mass. They will attack the one who decides to go the wrong way. So when everybody turns right, poor guy turns left. Okay? They will go and attack him. So when we separate from the masjid, then our iman is under attack. Remember, we have to accept of the unseen. It's part of our belief to accept in the shayateen. We believe in the shayateen. And we believe that this job is to whisper and to continuously pull our strings of hawa and desire and shahwa and ego and all these things which will bring us down. That's their job. But when we're hearing good things as well, coming to the masjid, when we're meeting a group of people, then that bond, you become strong. When you become an individual, then it's easily to be picked off and, and, and destroyed in that way. So jazak khair for individuals engaging with this. I will try to... Want it, I want it to be an interactive session that we have for the remaining few sessions that I am here. Uh, we've done plenty of lectures, and I'm sure you listen to lots of lectures as well. It's important that you yourself take responsibility for your own life. We're all responsible for our own life. I have taken responsibility for my own life. I then try to use whatever I've learned, whatever I've understood, to then benefit my wife, benefit my children, my parents. So I've taken my responsibility. But we, we try not to be a community of I'm alright Jack. Meaning as long as I'm safe on Nuh al-Islam's ship, you can drown. So we do extend that out to our wider community. But it's your own responsibility for firstly yourself to get on that ship and then to get your wife and children and those people who are dependent upon you also on that ship. So please use this time, sit, reflect as well. Rec recitation is important, but also reflection. We need time to reflect, to look over things, to think and ponder. And if we don't think or ponder, then we'll just be robotic in our actions. And we can easily be disturbed from there.